Well, good evening. It is really great to see all of you here, and welcome to the 2015 D Triple C D STEM Institute Summit. And I'm Joe May. I'm uh, proud to serve as Chancellor of the Dallas County Community College District, and a real honor to uh, to, to welcome you to what I'm uh, is uh, just going to be an incredible event tonight. I'd like to begin by thanking some of those who make this event and our STEM Institute possible. And first, our lead investor is the W.W. Uh, w. Carruth Jr. Foundation at Communities Foundation of Texas. Let's give them applause because we wouldn't be here without their, their, their support. And I believe Dr. Denise Devora is here with the uh, Communities Foundation of Texas. Are, are you here? Can you? Th there you are in the back. Thank you so much for, for joining us this evening. And, uh, and Other special guests that are here, we, uh, we, we have an outstanding uh, a board of trustees that's elected to serve the citizens of the Dallas County Community College District. And with us tonight is Bob Ferguson with TD Industries. Bob, thank you very much for, for being here. And I also want to acknowledge uh, one of our presidents of our seven colleges, uh, uh, Krista Slaco, president of North Lake College. Thank you so much for, for joining us as well. You know, today we, we, we really face a real challenge in our country with over 8.6 million American jobs in existence right now that require STEM degrees and education. Uh, we're struggling to fill those jobs across the country. In fact, only 35% of students ever attempt to complete a STEM degree. And of those who start, only 19% actually earn that degree. That gap is creating a crisis for us in America, and as we really meet, uh, strive to meet the needs of our economy and the workforce uh, today. The STEM Institute is an outstanding program that was designed to change these numbers for these students that are here tonight. And in just six years, we've served over 600 students with a 90% completion rate, 90% completion. That's a long way from the 19% that we see of the typical student. These students are known as our STEM scholars. Tonight, scholars, would you please stand and let us recognize you uh, for your accomplishments. Wow, this is great. And also in attendance tonight is our wonderful group of STEM faculty fellows, which includes the most respected math and science faculty from across the district. Would you stand, please, and let us recognize you, and thank you for joining us. And along with Dr. Peggy, Peggy Shattuck, uh, Peggy, thank you for your leadership. Please stand, yeah. For, as the uh, DCCCD STEM Institute Director, and, uh, and we really appreciate your leadership as uh, we've uh, changed the lives of, of so many students uh, and, and allowed them to be able to earn a degree, transfer to a four-year uh, college or university, and earn the baccalaureate degree. I'd, uh, this evening also, I want to uh, um, introduce uh, Hunter Hunt. Hunter is the uh, where, where's Hunter? Here, there you are. Hi. <laughs> Hunter is the chair of the DCCCD Foundation Board and uh, one of the big supporters of not only the STEM Institute, but of uh, the Dallas County Community College District and helping us meet the needs of every citizen in this county. Hunter, would you join us, please, here? And, and thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. May, and, um, and thanks to all of y'all for coming out tonight. This is going to be an absolutely fabulous evening, and we're, we're blessed that, that you're here in attendance. Um, uh, I do have some fellow board members with me here tonight from the DCCCD Foundation Board. Uh, these are folks from the community that are absolutely passionate about the future of these students that are here, and I want to introduce them, if that's okay. Uh, Ruben Esquivel from UT Southwestern is over here. We have actually on the same role, we, we have uh, Mark Paul from, uh, from UBS. Can you stand, please? 
Uh, and then finally, we also have um, AK Majo. And uh, AK, I thought it was over there as well. Yep. Again, these are folks that are, are dedicating um, their hours, their time, and their, um, and their, their uh, donations towards the future of, of y'all in this room, and, and I'm thrilled that they're here with us tonight. Um, so Dr. May earlier introduced all of these STEM scholars and the faculty who are here, and I, I have to tell you, for those of you who have not had a chance to spend time with these students, please do so. The, the, the reception is a great opportunity to interact and mingle and talk to them about what they're studying and, and what, they're, what they aspire to do in the future. These students are phenomenal. And we, I've been very fortunate. We've had several of them actually intern and work with us um, at our company. I encourage any employers who are here uh, who are interested in getting a little help from, um, from the STEM skills, skills. If you're interested in, um, in hiring any interns, please come see me or any of the other faculty who are here, because uh, we'd love to put you in touch. It is, it is so inspiring to talk to these kids and get a sense of what the future holds. And as Dr. May introduced the fellows as well, that is a unique aspect of the STEM, STEM program that candidly most other programs that focus on STEM don't entail. And it, is, uh, it has almost been the single most important determinant of what has put our STEM scholars program on a level different from, from everyone else in the country. The commitment of time and mentoring and insight um, and belief that these mentors put into these kids is really what, is, what has allowed this program to be what it is today. So thank all of you all so much. Um, and now it's actually my great pleasure to introduce our special guest this evening, Dr. Nina Tandon. Um, Dr. Tandon is CEO and co-founder of Epibone, which is the world's first company growing living human bones for skeletal reconstruction. Uh, she's also a tissue engineer, and I'd, I'd heard of double E's and ME's, but I'd never heard of a tissue engineer. Um, at Columbia University and an adjunct professor of electrical engineering at the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Arts. Dr. Tannen spent the early part of her career in a telecom company, actually, at, at Avaya Labs, and then she transitioned into biomedical engineering through her Fulbright Scholarship in Italy, where she worked on a, an electronic nose used to smell lung cancer. Um, absolutely fascinating stuff. And so she, after that, she uh, spent a year of consulting at McKinsey and Company, uh, and she's now continuing her research on the use of electrical stimulation for broader tissue engineering applications. I do have a concern, I have to admit, I, I don't want any of the students here to think that she's a slacker, but she only has four degrees. Um, she has a bachelor's in electrical engineering from Cooper Union. She's a master's in bioelectrical engineering from MIT. She also has an MBA from Columbia University, and then just to, uh, to put the cherry on top, she earned her PhD from Columbia in 2009, which focused on studying electrical signaling in the context of tissue engineering. So please help me welcome to the stage Dr. Nina Tandon. It's really nice to be here, um, and um, I'm really looking forward to seeing, I hope, the majority of you guys tomorrow morning um, for a, a deeper discussion. Um, but I am hoping to um, not just capitalize on the, on the microphone here and to open this up to a dialogue. So if you have questions, try and save them so that we'll have a minute or two at the end to, to have a discussion, OK? Because that's the most fun part. Um, so. I'm dreading this first slide, guys. Are we ready? <laughs> so we all have a picture like this, right? Yeah? We're, you're eight years old, you get your first chemistry set, and your smile's so big, like your afro. Um, right? Um, so yeah, um, that's enough. <laughs> I'm from a bit of a geeky family. Uh, this is, uh, these are my siblings. Um, uh, my sister, Sheila my younger sister Mira, and then me, and then my, my brother Neil. And um, when, I, when I look at this picture, I see a lot of things. You know, I see you know, us, we're at a science museum in Toronto. We're putting together an arch together. We're collaborating as we learn about science. Um, we're putting together an arch, which you could argue is civilization's, um, one of civilization's greatest technologies. Um, you know, but. When I think about this time, I also trace back what's become more than a bit of a professional preoccupation for me, um, because my, my two sisters, actually, Sheila and Mira, are both red-green colorblind, 
And my brother Neil has um, an X-linked eye, eye disease called retinitis pigmentosa. And, and so you can imagine, you know, growing up, um, really <laughs> having a lot of these kind of um, interesting discussions about like the nature of color and, and, you know, is that, you know, and it would come into other discussions, like some of which were humorous and some not so much of, you know, those are, that's lipstick, not eyeshadow, or that's a red light, not a green light, and, and things like that. And in my brother's case, um, he's actually legally blind, so in Canada, but not the US, go figure. Um, and so it really impacted where, where he could live, okay? So he actually lives in Toronto. Um, and, and actually, you know what, I might just point out what they're doing now, too, because I, I am really proud, a proud sister. Um, but I'm like kind of the odd one out because everyone else is kind of in, in a different field. So we were talking about energy, right? Um, my older sister, Sheila, uh, has her PhD in photovoltaics um, and she's at GE doing um, solar um, strategy now. She used to do research. Um, my younger sister, Mira, is also in energy. She's at um, Consolidated Edison, so uh, Con Ed, as we say in New York. Um, and she's one of those black ops people that's trying to get people to reduce their energy <laughs> consumption. She collaborates with startups um, in the city. Oh, she's adorable. Um, and my younger brother, Neil, is um, a climate change scientist. He's a mathematician up in, um, working at the Canadian government. And so, you know, I thought I was the odd one out, you know, because I ended up in biology. But we'll get back to that. Maybe that's not so true. Um, but anyway. So just another picture. <laughs> I played with this game as a kid, <laughs> not knowing that eventually I would, it would become a joke, looking back. Um, <laughs> uh, it was a fun game. Anyone play Operation? Yeah? Does anyone still play that? Okay. So I followed this professional preoccupation, basically, this idea that, um, you know, that biology, as amazing as it was, you know, because after all, biology is what enables us to be alive, but also enables our experience of being alive, right? So vision and, and all of that stuff. And, and that it was, in the case of my siblings, it was very much related to their biology, the fact that they saw the world differently. In the case of um, my brother, it was just a single base pair deletion in the rhodopsin gene. Um, <laughs> um, and with my sisters, it's you know, a little bit more complicated. But, but basically, this idea that biology, as incredible as it is and miraculous it is, as it is, is also fallible, right? And so I guess for me, this kind of fed this, the, the fuel to the fire of biology being a technology, right? So I traced this professional preoccupation. This is a digital theremin that I built in undergrad. Any musicians here know what I'm talking about, this instrument? It's a musical instrument that you play without touching it because your, your electromagnetic waves from your own body are interfering with an oscillating circuit, right? So it's a really incredible machine. Um, through computer vision, this is me and my undergrad thesis. Um, and then um, I, I think it was mentioned in my biography that I ended up going into telecom after undergrad um, and then after work, you know, when I couldn't drop my, um, my interests. Um, I started taking classes at the local community college um, when I was in uh, New Jersey at the time at Raritan Valley. And this is where uh, I, the bug for physiology, where I got bit. You know, um, I was so ripe for this, you know. Uh, I was taking these physiology classes and the professor would talk about DNA and I was like, oh my gosh, that's like a hard drive. Um, or the equations for governing the transmission of electrical signals around nerves, I couldn't help but compare to the telephone lines in the building. Um, and actually, the, that, that analogy goes pretty deep. The cable equations really do describe both of those things. You're nodding, yep. <laughs> Yes. Um, and so I ended up in uh, regenerative medicine. Uh, so this is a painting, uh, The Fountain of Youth. Any art historians in the room? Um, this idea, this is sort of that um, sort of encapsulates the goal of our field. Um, you see people kind of decrepit and upset on the left-hand side, and they frolic about in this pool and emerge on the other side rejuvenated. And of course, it's not so simple. Um, but this is what we aim to do in our field of tissue engineering. So tissue engineering is a field that's meant to you know, grow um, body parts for ourselves in the lab that can help us extend our healthy lives. Um, and so, <laughs> woo! <laughs> um, and so this is some work from my, my PhD work. You know? So I'm an electrical engineer, and I built the heart. Okay, The heart is an electrical being. Does anyone ever think about it that way? The, electric, the heart gives off signals a thousand times stronger than the brain. And as an electrical engineer, I was really captivated by this idea and built circuits to speak to cardiac cells so that we could coax them into becoming better heart 
tissue, right? Because cells are not tissues, right? They have to come together and join forces and, in this case, um, beat in synchrony. This is from my, my PhD work, which is now looking back. It's almost 10 years old. Oh my gosh. Um, and now I have a startup that um, I started with some PhD students in the lab with me. It's called EpiBone. Um, we grow bones um, from stem cells, um, personalized shape. Um, so there's an anatomical fit, a perfect anatomical fit, and also a perfect immunological fit because, of course, the cells come from the patients themselves. And, um, and it's really exciting to be doing this. And so I wanted to give you a little bit of overview of our field and then also um, you know, ask some questions of you. Um, so a lot of people ask me, why bone? Why did you jump ship from heart to bone? And, um, and I say, well, you know, if you think about the human body, right? And what, what would be an easy tissue to grow? What would you think? I mean, you've got the answer up here, right? This is the thing. I teach with my students, and I always say the answer is right, always on the slide. <laughs> right, so what's easy, right? OK, maybe a, cell, maybe a single cell type tissue, maybe something flat, right? Something like skin, right? Or maybe hollow structures like the trachea and so on. Or something that doesn't have vasculature like cartilage. Um, but what would be really hard? Something that has a complex three-dimensional shape, maybe made of multiple cell types, maybe interacting with other organs, something like the heart or the liver, right? And bone is really interesting because it's kind of in the middle. Um, it's a complex structure, but we can solve that using digital fabrication tools that other people have developed, and we start with a single cell type. And so bone, which my office mate was growing while I was growing cardiac tissue, Sarind, um, he and I joined forces for starting this startup. Okay, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about that, but I won't wax too poetic on that. Don't worry. So bone. Um, did you know that bone after, after blood is the most transplanted material, human material? I didn't know that. Um, you know, millions of procedures per year, billions of dollars spent worldwide. And you know what? We don't do such a great job when we transplant bone. We don't. Um, you know, this is a picture of Roger Ebert for many of you who maybe remember him as a movie critic. Um, he had salivary cancer that had metastasized to the bone in his um, jaw. And so they removed his jaw as part of his treatment and replaced it using pieces of his shoulder and hip. And, um, and it didn't take. So not only was he left with a non-functioning jaw, he was also left with all of these secondary surgical sites. And that contributed to you know, a, a change in posture that maybe led to, his, um, to a slip and fall and then a hip, um, a, a broken hip and so on. It didn't work, right? And, and if you think about pediatric patients, there really just isn't enough bone to go around. So this is the kind of, this is the kind of, um, this is where regenerative medicine can really fill the void, so to speak. Okay. And a lot of people talk about the population aging and, and needing new bones for this. But you know what I like, what I what I've learned in my um, experience in this field is that actually it's it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, did you know that over the past ten years? Um, the number of ACL tears in, in young people, so under the age of 18, has gone up by 400%. Okay, and a lot of those are young girls, actually, because of the biomechanical properties of like hip to knee, right? And these torsional sports, that, like soccer and so on. And so it's not just that we need implants that are um, better, but we need implants that can bring us to age 115 <laughs> from age 15. Right? We need long-lasting implants that live with us. So what do we do? How does it work? Um, we do two things. We take two things from the patient. We take stem cells from the patient. Right? So that's from a, a small biopsy of adipose tissue. That's a polite way of saying fat. Um, and we take a CT scan from the patient so we can image the three-dimensional structure that we need to build. We extract that 3D image. And we, <laughs> and we make a bioreactor that is matched to that bone. Okay. So, um, and then we cultivate those cells and, the, and the, the bone scaffolding, and then after three weeks, we have a piece of tissue that's ready for implantation. So here's a short video explaining how it works. It's the bones and the cells, and we machine the scaffolding into the correct shape. We grow the cells up in incubators, and in our bioreactor, after three weeks, we have a piece of living, human, anatomically shaped bone that's hopefully ready for implantation. Now, I don't want to, like, it's not a business, this is not a pitch, so, but I do want to tell you that we think that this is good for, for several reasons. One is that there's a perfect fit, that's important. But two, because it's from your own cells, it doesn't get rejected by the body and it can integrate better. And because it's alive, it can continue to grow with you. 
Okay, we've, we're still undergoing preclinical validation. The rest of my team right now is in Louisiana doing surgeries on pigs. They're a little upset with me for not being with them, but they'll get over it. Um, <laughs> and um, what we've seen is over three months and six months of implantation, that border between the graft and the native bone is almost indistinguishable, right? Um, and, and, and you notice that after three months, there is a, you can tell which side is the graft and which side is the bone, right? And that's interesting because, you know, we only grow the bone for three weeks. Has anyone had a broken bone, right? Anyone ever been in a cast? How long were you in a cast? Anyone want to shout that out? Too, too long. <laughs> two months, eight weeks, right? So, and I mentioned that we grow the bones for three weeks before we implant them, right? And so, you know, there's this magic number for bone healing that's around six weeks. And we kind of hypothesize that we, we grow the bones for three weeks, so they're immature enough to sync up with what's there, but they're mature enough to provide the um, support that's needed upon implantation. So the, the, the idea that these bones continue to grow along with the body while they're implanted is, is probably part of why they work so well. Um, and they vascularize. They get new blood vessels coming in after implantation. So we're really excited. We're based in Harlem. This is a picture of the team. And we've just closed on a round of funding, which has given us some, some runway. And we're really excited about that. It was in the Wall Street Journal. It's like crazy for us scientists to have done that. Um, so we're really excited. And we're, it's really just the beginning for us there. And, um, but I just wanted to set, that's all I'll say about EpiBone, <laughs> um, except that what's really exciting to me, beyond just the fact that this is my career, and we're having fun in the lab, and we're doing something that's it's not been done before. So there's an excitement around that. But um, you know, we're a long way from clinic. We're maybe eight years, if we're lucky. Um, and so something else needs to be sustaining our daily life, you know, what keeps us getting up in the morning and, and going to the lab and, 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 um, and toiling. Um, and, and for me, what that is, is I feel as if we're part of this bigger story. So what story is that? You might guess, right? The answer's on the slide. Um, <laughs> I, I like to think of the history of how we got where we are. How did we get here? And, and you know, in, in a lot of us are preoccupied with this question, poets and um, philosophers, right? Um, but for me, it's, it's taken this particular tack. You know, what is the history of how we view the body? And how is that changing? You know, and, and that's what I, I, where do we start? I kind of call this body 1.0. Does anyone know this picture, Leonardo's Vitruvian Man, right? It's an iconic image, kind of celebrating the symmetry and proportionality of the human body. And, and what I like about this image, besides being a Leonardo fan, is that um, I think it kind of exemplifies this idea that we kind of had faith as, huma as a human population for many years in um, the integrity of the body. So if something was wrong with the body, we would maybe use leeches, right? Or, but basically, it was like, hope for the best and, and leave it alone, right? I mean, we have counterexamples. Don't get me wrong. We've got examples from South America, um, prehistoric times with bone implants used to repair the skull. Um, we've got examples of Indian and um, Egyptian surgeons. Egyptian surgeons did um, used coral as dental implants, for example. So we have interesting counterexamples, but basically this, this narrative was the same. But around the turn of the last century, this really began to change. Around the same time that interchangeable parts became used on the assembly line, right? Um, we started to view the body as a summation of parts. And so if something was wrong with the heart, if you, you might get one from a donor or, or, or engineer a new heart. But, but basically the idea was, OK, instead of a body being in, an integral unit, it was one step down. Right, the parts of the bodies were. Well, this is when we started thinking about organs as you know separate systems from each other. Um, and again, this is a global story. You know, the first hip implantation, the first hip replacement. Anyone want to guess where that took place? Or anyone know? It was in Burma, with an 83-year-old Burmese nun, and she got a piece of ivory. Right. Um, first heart transplantation. Anyone know? South Africa. Yeah. First hand transplantation. This one I only learned recently. Ecuador, Ecuador, right? So it's, it's a really, really global story, OK? Um, but where we are now is we are almost drilling down one level deeper. Instead of thinking of the body or body parts, we're thinking about cells, OK? Cells as the workhorses of the body. And what can we do if we collaborate with those cells, OK? And so I almost like, you know, I like this image because it's like thinking of cells as living building blocks. And what are the things we can do if we start thinking about the cells themselves as the units? Okay. And by the way, this is a Drosophila embryo, a fruit fly embryo. I love these beautiful images of biology. So I started out with a baby picture. So 
Um, I'll start out with a baby picture for all of you. <laughs> all of us. Because we all looked like this at one point, right? We were all eight cells big. Actually, we were all one cell big at one point, right? And how did we get to be those people that we are? Again, this is a philosophical question. A lot of people wonder this. Um, but for us in tissue engineering, it takes also a very specific tech. Um, how did those stem cells that we were become the muscle, become the neuron, become the skin, become all of the cells that we are? And um, this is, of course, the realm of the field of developmental biology. Anyone study developmental biology? No? Well, this is like how embryos become organisms, right? Multicellular organisms. And, um, and so for us as tissue engineers, we, 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 we learn from this, from this field of developmental biology and almost view it as a playbook, right? Because engineers want to know, well, what can I do with that? How can I build something with that, right? And so we say, oh, okay, if, if, you need, if electrical signals come into play with getting those stem cells into muscle, maybe I'll look, apply electrical signals in the lab and see what happens. Right? This, is, this is kind of the, the give and take between um, biology, which is a basic science, and engineering, which is an applied science. Right? So this, this field then takes this, um, this paradigm, which is taking cells and putting them on scaffolds, scaffolds being these three dimensions, biomaterials, basically, and combining them in bioreactors. Bioreactors are kind of like fancy fish tanks, right? Like if you think about a saltwater fish getting saltwater and a freshwater fish getting freshwater. Um, what does a heart cell need? <laughs> what does a bone cell need, right? And so that's what that system does, is try to engineer the environment that's most appropriate for those cells, again, inspired by developmental biology, to become those tissues, okay? So what can we do with this? I mean, I, I showed you heart and I showed you bone, but I want to give you a tour of what other researchers are doing around the world, because there's, it's really an amazing field with many, 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 many people. So you can make living implants. So this is um, Tony Atala's work from Wake Forest University growing bladder um, at Harold Ott's lab at Harvard growing um, lung and kidneys. Um, Laura Nicholson's lab, they have a company called Humicite where they're growing blood vessels. They're in clinical trials right now. Okay, so we can grow living body parts. Okay, but remember that chart of complexity? <laughs> um, we don't... We haven't yet gotten there with liver and um, kidney and so on. But what can we do in the meantime? And the heart, right? Well, the thing is, is even if those, those tissues aren't yet ready for implantation, there are still very, very high fidelity models for testing drugs, right? They may not be perfectly functional, but they're certainly more representative of what's happening inside your body than, say, flat biology, growing cells in a Petri dish. OK, so this is one thing where we, one field where we hope to disrupt um, healthcare beyond just making these medical devices. Um, this is a very hot topic, um, the drug screening process. I mean, these numbers are, they get higher every day. Um, healthcare spending is outpacing that of the gross domestic process, um, product by leaps and bounds. It's, it's frightening. And, and basically, the drug screening process, you ever wonder why it takes 10 years and billions of dollars for a single molecule to get approved, right? Because you have to test it a lot. And that's a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of cost. Um, so drug formulation and then going through lab testing and animal testing and then clinical trials that you might call human testing before drugs get to market, okay? And a lot of times when a drug even gets the mar hits the market, it acts in an unpredictable way and actually hurts people. And the later a drug fails, the worse the consequences. And you might be asking, well, why? You know? And some of, these, some of these failures are catastrophic and are what's called idiosyncratic, which basically means no one knows why until it happens, okay? Because it all boils down to two issues, right? One, humans are not rats. And, um, and I live in New York, so this is a big deal. Um, but two, right, so we can't be testing drugs on rats and expect them to act exactly the way they would act in people. There's a mismatch, right? We're not rats. And secondly, despite the incredible similarities between all of us, those teeny tiny differences in our DNA have huge impacts with how we metabolize drugs and how they affect us. So what if we could use these tissue engineered models to represent ourselves better than rats in the lab and also reflect our diversity, right? Tissue engineering can help us do that. One of the technologies that makes this possible, this is Nobel Prize winning science from Japan, 
It's called induced pluripotent stem cells. Have you guys learned about these in school? You know, they were um, developed pretty recently. Um, so basically, what, what you do is you take non-stem cells, so say a skin cell sample, right? And reprogram those cells using um, genes from embryonic genes, and then culture them, and then harvest them. So you end up with these kind of embryonic stem cells, which basically mean they can become any tissue in the body, but without the controversy of embryonic stem cells, okay? And you can grow them from any adult. So you can grow them, your brain, your heart, your liver, um, and so on. And so what we're really hoping is that even if we can't make a functional heart that can be used for heart transplantation, that we can still do, you know, almost a clinical trial on a chip and be able to test a thousand molecules on, say, your particular heart or test a single molecule on a thousand different, you know, organoid hearts, right? And, and, get, and, and speed up this feedback loop between developing a molecule in the lab and seeing how it acts in the body. And that's all just growing healthy tissues, by the way. We can also grow diseased tissues in the lab. So this is an example from Kevin Egan's lab at Harvard, where they took, um, they made induced pluripotent stem cells from patients who had Lou Gehrig, the gene for Lou Gehrig's disease and differentiated them into neurons, and then grew those neurons in the lab. And what's interesting is that those neurons showed symptoms of the disease, right? So with disease models like these, you can imagine that we can hone in on cures faster than ever before. Um, this is another example of patient-specific stem cells, IPS cells grown in the lab. Um, this is from a, a stem cell line that was generated from a person who has retinitis pigmentosa, the genes for this. Um, and this, as I mentioned, is the disease that runs in my family. So we watch these kinds, the science very closely. So a lot of you might be thinking, well, these models sound well and good, but you know, actually, <laughs> the rat is pretty good because it has interacting systems of organs, and don't you, you know, take an antidepressant and the byproducts might be stored in the, in the fat after they're digested in the liver, right? Um, don't you miss all that with these tissue-engineered models? And what's interesting is that the field is actually developing towards this, um, and now with the new announcement from Obama for precision medicine, this, this research is really accelerating. Um, and it's still in the cartoon phase because it's very hard. <laughs> it hasn't yet been done. But this is where the field is going, um, growing multiple tissues on the same chip so that you can start to recapitulate some of those um, interacting um, organ systems um, in the lab. Um, Here's another example from Karen Berg's lab at Clemson University where they were 3D printing breast cancer cells in the lab. And you can imagine that, you know, if, you, if God forbid anyone ever gets a diagnosis that they have cancer, that they can start to grow their own cells in the lab and be able to test different cocktails of drugs on their specific cancer to be able to know, um, you know, you don't really have a lot of time to waste if you get that diagnosis. You don't have a lot of chances to experiment on yourself. You've got one shot. So to get your, your best shot, you know, you can um, start to test drugs on, in the lab. And, and, and speaking of these kind of interacting, you know, organ chips, you can also imagine growing, say, epibone in the lab in conjunction with some of these cancers to be able to start studying cancer metastasis, right? So we're really starting to get to the point where we can understand in the lab what's happening in the body by recapitulating in the lab. Okay, so that's, that's tissue engineering, um, but I, I thought this might be fun um, to get a little provocative with you guys tonight so that we could have a nice discussion. And so I thought, why not ask you guys some questions? <laughs> so what else? <laughs> what else should I be watching out for? Okay, so um, I think that some of you, did some of you guys, were some of you guys here last year when you met Skylar? Some of you, right? So Skylar's a friend, and he's not actually in this talk. I, I didn't realize um, the connection. But there are others. When I met Skylar four years ago, I was, it was, he was part of my TED Fellowship class. And um, I started, in, this was in 2011 when he and I met, and then there are others in our class, um, one of whom is on the next slide. And um, we started realizing that actually a lot of us were thinking about some of these biological issues, um, and we were in very different fields. So Skylar Tibbetts, who spoke at this symposium last year, is an architect. And he does work with, um, how do I say it? Oh, he would kill me. <laughs> but making these three-dimensional structures that self-assemble, right? And that's a lot like a protein. A lot of his work is kind of in, is inspired by protein folding, right? Um, so a lot of these, we have examples in nature of, of self-assembly of structures. And of course, biology is, and genetic circuits are, are and, and, or DNA methylation, right? We have all these examples in nature of how um, energy is saved by, by self-assembly, okay? But not just him, there were others. 
And I, and I was blown away thinking, wow, there are so many of us that are really thinking about how do we learn from biology in our respective fields. Okay? So I, I just wanted to give you an overview of that, too. Okay, so from our same fellowship class, maybe you'll bring her here next year. <laughs> this is Suzanne Lee. She's a fashion designer, okay? And she's based, she was based in London until very recently we managed to poach her and bring her to Brooklyn. So she's now my neighbor. Um, and she asked the question, you know, okay, so what do we all have in common, right? And, and I'm a, I really enjoy English and writing. Anyone else? You know, a secret closet? poet, you know, art, art, art therapy as I call it, because I won't share my work with anyone. But um, I like to think sometimes about how English can unlock science and science unlock writing, right? And, and I think that it can be very powerful sometimes to ask a question that just has a, it's almost like a Mad Lib, right? And in this case, the question that's underlying all of these examples is, can I do fill in the blank with cells? <laughs> Okay, and I think that all of us were asking this question. So in Suzanne's case, okay, um, she's a London, she was a London-based fashion designer, and she used a kom kombucha. Anyone drink kombucha? Right? It's this kind of funny-tasting fermented tea that's got bacteria, yeast, sugar, and water. Anyway, she grows that, and there's this, and, and she, she uses that to grow bacterial cellulose. Okay, so cellulose is like what's, what cotton is made out of, right? Cotton is, did you know that, I mean, cotton is a natural material. And organic cotton, you know, you might think is very friendly to the environment, but cotton is a very, very taxing process on the environment to grow, okay? But if you grow cellulose using bacteria, um, it's a much more efficient process and you get much more um, perfectly nanostructurally sound shapes, <laughs> right? Perfect. And, and so perfect, in fact, that certain high fidelity speakers from like Sony, for example, use bacterial cellulose instead of cotton for their, the membranes, for speakers and so on. So anyway, she's done this. She's grown bacterial cellulose, and she calls it like a vegetable leather. And she's made everything from shoes to jackets. Um, meet Mitch Joachim, another TED fellow. He's a New York City architecture professor. And he asked, why can we grow buildings? OK. Um, he said, why not grow a home? And he's experimented with growing living lattices that can someday, these are prototypes, serve as living walls. This is Andras Forgots. He's the CEO of a company called Modern Meadow, also based in Brooklyn, a company that uses biofabrication techniques, a lot like what we use in the lab for growing um, muscles and bones, um, to grow meat and leather, basically asking, can, why grow fields of grass or corn to feed our cattle that we then slaughter for meat and leather? Why not just grow the meat and leather directly? So this is um, his, one of his scientists who's, who's growing um, tissue in the lab. And meet Damien Palin. He's a biomineralogist, okay? And he collaborates with bacteria to mine valuable minerals from desalination brine, okay? This is a toxic byproduct that's a result of um, desalinating seawater, okay? So creating wealth from waste while protecting the environment, these are the kinds of things that you can start to think of doing if you collaborate with biology. It's like, well, why biology, right? I mean, biology is magic, okay? Like, imagine, imagine, I mean, it's magic because we haven't yet figured it out, but imagine, I mean, I, I did this exercise with my students, you know, imagine a world where energy is converted at a rate 10,000 times more efficiently than the sun, where broken bridges repair themselves, and um, I forget the other one, uh, or batteries are alive. <laughs> and it's like, well, guess what? We already live in that world. Okay, mitochondria convert energy gram for gram 10,000 times more efficiently than the sun. Our bones break down and repair themselves every day and every single cell in your body has a voltage across its cell membrane that competes with our technologies for, the, for capacitance, okay? These are amazing technologies that are, you know, messy and they're not dry, they're at ambient temperatures, okay? We are not nowhere close to being able to do this with our, think about energy, right? And so this is where I, I start to think, you know, maybe I have something a little bit in common with my siblings. Maybe our worlds will converge when we think about some of these, these questions of, of sustainability, right? Maybe, maybe biology can help us um, confront some of these challenges. Anyway, meet, meet some more people. <laughs> this is Ingmar Rydell Cruz. He's a bioengineering professor at Stanford, okay? And he, oh, okay. I showed you the cardiac cells, right? And they're beating. 
What I didn't tell you is that um, the voltage that I applied to those cells um, is three volts per centimeter. That's pretty close to the voltages that you would experience in, in the body, the um, electrical fields in the body. So what he did, which was really interesting, there's, um, oh, also during my PhD, I studied wound healing. And did you know that every time you have a cut, you've got an electrical field that's created across it, right? Because we're made out of salt water. A lot of people say we're made out of water, but we're made out of salt water, okay? Um, we, we, we really have salt water in our bodies. We, we carry the ocean within us. Someone said this. Um, such a poetic way to put it. Um, but anytime you have a cut, those salt water ions move. Right? And ions are charged particles, right? So that's a current, okay? And anytime you have a current, you have an associated electric field, right? Um, and this goes away after the wound heals. So those wound currents are also oftentimes three volts, five volts per centimeter, okay? So there are a lot of microorganisms that apparently respond to these electric fields. It's called galvanotaxis. They move in um, the presence of an electric field. So stem cells have been known to do this. I studied this during my PhD. So anyway, this guy, he's a professor at Stanford, he discovered that there were certain, I mean, it had been discovered before him, but there are certain microorganisms that also exhibit galvanotaxis. They move in response to an electric field. So what did he do? He said, okay, well, let's take some microbes. <laughs> and I'm almost out of time, but I can't resist. Okay, so he takes these microbes and takes electrodes, two and two, hooks them up to a joystick. You following me here? Um, puts a camera underneath the microbes, does image detection on the location of said microbes, and integrates them into a video game. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, beat the world's first biotic video games. Um, so this is an example of Microbash. It's inspired by the classic video game Breakout, in case anyone played the Atari, um, where paramecia are guided to clear blocks with the ball. Okay. Um, and just in case you thought no industry was left out of biology, you know, creeping into it, meet J. Rim Lee. She is, actually, she just got a new job at the Stanford D School, the design school. She developed a strain of mushroom that she calls the infinity mushroom. She's an artist. Um, and she uses it as the active element in a kind of living coffin. She's made this bodysuit um, that helps remediate the toxic byproducts that are released into the environment after death during decomposition. So it almost begs the question, you know, what can't be done? <laughs> and does anyone remember this image? This is an iconic image from the late 90s. And, and why is it such an iconic image? Why did it anger so many people? I mean, I can tell you why I think it did. Because um, it's not exactly clear why this rodent needed a human ear on its back, right? And so I love this, this quote from Chekhov. Um, the role of the artist is to ask questions, not to answer them. Um, and so there, there are two um, people that I wanted to introduce. I asked them for a picture of themselves, and they sent me this. Um, this is Yonat Zur and Oren Katz. Um, they're a husband and wife team. And when they saw that image of, of the rat with the, um, or the mouse with the ear on its back, what did they do about it? Okay, any activists here in the audience? Okay, well, you can, don't worry, you can keep it undercover. Um, but what would you do? You know, would you do what they did, which is say, you know what, I'm going to Harvard. These guys live in Australia, by the way. We're going to Harvard, we're going to register at medical school, and we're going to become research fellows and learn how to do tissue engineering for the purposes of art, not science. That's what they did. Um, they have a lab called Symbiotica in um, Australia, which is just incredible. So they, they're very ironic. They would do things like, say, if pigs could fly, what would their wings look like? And they grew wings out of pig cells. Um, this is an exhibit I saw during my PhD at the MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art. Um, it's called their Victimless Leather Jacket. I don't know if you can see, there's a little itty-bitty jacket up in the, um, in the picture there. And, and in a Symbiotica-curated show, this is an, from an artist named Andre Brodick, he created these portraits. Can you see that there's a, it's a little bit blurry, but can you see that there's a portrait there painted in fluorescent um, paint? This fluorescent paint is actually bacteria that's been transfected with red fluorescent protein to glow. And what's interesting is at the same time that he transfected these cells to glow red, um, he also transfected them with a gene that's been implicated in human Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so as these portraits fade over time, they evoke this idea of lost memories in a way that very few other pieces of artwork arguably ever could. 
So I hope I'm convincing you that by learning to speak the language of cells, that we can coax them into doing a lot, saving lives, converting, conserving the planet, um, inspiring unprecedented works of art, and um, continuing to command our wonder. Um, but what's next, right? And, and you know, rather than asking what we could do, I think it's really important for us at this moment in time to ask what we should be doing, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of questions that just have to be addressed. You know, one, people ask, you know, are you playing God, right? But I think the deeper question here is, you know, is tinkering with, cell, you know, because we can't create life. We, we, we're very far from this. We're starting always with living materials. So I think that the question that's more honest to ask is to say, is tinkering with the living material of viruses, bacteria, plants, animals, humans, is that equal? Um, should there be different bars for tinkering with life for the sake of research, for the sake of education, or for the sake of entertainment, right? And if there are more bacterial cells in our human bodies than human cells, and if we can grow human cells outside the body and put them back in the human body, what are the boundaries of the human body? And what does it even mean to be human anyway, right? But, you know, these questions are hard. And, and then we can't outsource them. We can't have anyone else do the thinking for us, right? But the good news is, is we've done it before as a human, as a human population, right? These questions echo a lot of other past disruptive technologies. Um, I'm gonna just talk louder. <laughs> <laughs> Things like the telegraph. Has anyone ever read that book, The Victorian Internet? Right, they had everything from online dating to online, you know, online shopping and social media, all back then, right? Or and it wasn't so long ago that people were afraid that, um, of blood donation or um, in vitro fertilization, right? And we got through this by asking the difficult questions and attempting to answer them using our human brains. We can do this, but no one else can do it for us, okay? My, my theory is that once you see DNA and touch DNA, this is strawberry DNA, but for example, does anyone Isolated DNA from a strawberry, right? Lots of hands, right? My, my friend's toddler taught me how to do this. It is so easy. Um, I mean, crime scene shows and bioethics discussions really aren't the same if you've done it yourself. And so I really advocate for, you know, we talk about STEM education. I, I think that it, it should just be for everyone. You know, there's no reason why it should be specialized. It should be stuck in academia. And that's why I love that there's this new movement of biohacking. Has anyone heard of this? These biohacking spaces that are popping up all over the country. Okay, and, and my friends happen to have started the first one in Brooklyn called GenSpace. And I got a chance to work with some architecture students and teach them to grow skin samples. The idea was if we're printing skin and tattooing skin in the lab, these skin samples, um, what happens if what you print kind of doesn't stay where you put it? What does that mean for the nature of media, right? They were asking questions in a way that an engineer just wouldn't approach it. And I was so inspired by these kids um, that the next time I taught tissue engineering at Cooper Union, I, I said I refused to do it unless we open it up to the artists and architects. And let me tell you, those final projects were way more out there, and the bioethics discussions were way more interesting than when we had a single population of, of kids alone. And so, you know, we talk about STEM education, and I think it's great to go deep, but I also think we can't be afraid to reach far and wide. Um, so, uh, I'm really out of time. I, I'm, a lot of times people ask me like, if I have any advice, and you know, it's good that I'll go quickly through this because I'm not sure I do. Um, <laughs> but I think you know, if I had anything to offer, I would say I, I just really um, would encourage people to follow their curiosity wherever it takes them. To, to you know, whatever it is that makes you want to peek out of the consciousness of your own life, you know, outside, just follow that. <laughs> and be honest with yourself and others as you do so. And, and you'll find the righteous path. Um, don't forget kindness. A little of it goes a long way. Don't forget to be kind to yourselves. By the way, a lot of us forget that. Time flies, <laughs> so be nice to yourself. There's not much time. Even if we live to be 103, I don't know, I don't feel like that's enough time. I'm greedy, I guess. Um, paths often wind. I had no idea where I was going at any given moment, but you know, it's almost like those microorganisms, you kind of sniff towards this, the, the, chemokine, the chemokines, right? Or it's galvanotaxis, you kind of go towards um, where you're being pulled. 
And I can't resist showing this picture of my MBA classmate because I think, you know, I think we often forget that when you look to your left and you look to your right when you're at this age, that um, you never know where people are going to be. And um, you're probably each other's future best friends and colleagues. You're probably going to be selling each other insurance someday or grading each other's students' papers. You're going to be helping each other's kids find jobs. You have no idea, OK? These in this picture are investors in my company, <laughs> my insurance broker's boss's boss. I mean, I can't even tell you. It's crazy. And we were all classmates together studying and getting things wrong on exams and bonding, right? So look to your left and look to your right. You might just change each other's lives. You never know. Um, and, and along the way, try not to give up your hobbies. I think this is just a few pictures of the hobbies that I um, find most gratifying. Things like rock climbing, yoga, surfing, and running. Um, one thing I like about surfing is, we, is that it reminds us how small we are, right? Despite the magnitude of the work we might take on, we're teeny tiny people. <laughs> And uh, so, not to get stuck in the trap of hubris, um, does anyone know who this picture is of on the left? Anyone know? Hmm. Her name is Hedy Lamar. Hmm? Anyone know who that is based on her name? Say it loud, say it proud. She was an actress, you know? She was an amateur inventor. She wasn't a scientist per se, right? She didn't have the degree, but, but what did she do, right? A lot of people didn't know this until she was in her 80s. She invented frequency hopping, okay, that was used to control torpedoes in World War II, okay? It's in the, every, every, look at your cell phone, it's in your cell phone. It is the reason we can have cellular communication. Okay, and look on the right, who's that guy? Right, if I asked you before I told you that, who invented the cell phone, whose technology was more important for the cell phone, what would you have said, right? I mean, and who's remembered for what? She's remembered as a Hollywood actress. And what is he remembered? All, a lot of the things he's remembered for are things he didn't do. And a lot of things he did do are not remembered, right? So I think it's really important to, to not forget that our own individual lives are our own. And, and that as beautiful as the work we do is, like, don't get caught up in the ego of that. And don't forget to pause. This is one thing I'm working on. Um, <laughs> You know, those pauses, those naps, meditation, all of that, it's, it's a way to clean the brain. And um, I think uh, the, other, the last thing I wanted to say is don't forget to say thank you, right? So thank you. Um, okay. This is my last slide. <laughs> this is my niece, Sonia. She's one of my favorite people in the whole world. And this is a picture of her playing with her first choo-choo train, right? at Christmas last year. She's so much bigger now. I was going to show you another picture of her with her big choo-choo train, but this will suffice. Um, when I think about the world that we're creating for them every day that we work, right? And then when I really think about the world that she is likely and her cohort is going to create for us, if the first industrial revolution was about machines, right? And the second one that you could argue we're in the middle of right now, is about information. Isn't it really exciting to think that the third industrial revolution, which we can get to by asking, what can we do with cells, that that revolution could be about life? So I'll stop there and say thank you. And I think we have time for a couple questions, right? <laughs> do we? I think maybe not. We don't. I'm in here. I'm staying around. Thank you. Thank you. See you at the reception. So we, we, we actually, the good news is, is we do have time for questions, but the bad news is, is it's not here. Um, so we did want to say, Dr. Tannen, thank you so much. And as a token of our appreciation, uh, here is the scarf. Oh, thank you. With the pattern of a stem cell on. So oh, my is, God, uh, that is so cool. Yeah.